the air with brand new reporting tonight. A top Hamas leader telling our team they're willing to release all the hostages they kidnapped if Israel stops its strikes. We'll have the latest from the region, plus an interview with an Israeli mother whose family is among those abducted, plus the latest on the attack on a hospital in Gaza, reportedly killing hundreds. Whose rocket was it? That is still not clear, as thousands of civilians in Gaza are running out of water, food, and fuel. Plus, President Biden getting ready to head to Israel, top of the agenda, getting those hostages freed. What we know is the president's preparing to land in an active war zone. Then we follow the money in tonight's breakdown on who's actually paying to help Hamas commit its acts of terror. And here in Washington, House Republicans in the next hour or so set to take another shot to try to pick a speaker after one vote failed already today. So can somebody, anybody get it done and get Congress functioning again? That's coming up a little bit later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight, another critical moment in the Israel-Hamas war. Our Richard Engel, late tonight, getting word of a new offer from Hamas, claiming they would release the hostages they kidnapped in that terror attack if Israel stops bombing Gaza. Still so many questions on that. And questions here, too, with reports at least 200 people are dead. After a hospital was bombed late today, you're looking at some of the aftermath, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. And if that is the case, it would be the deadliest incident inside Gaza so far in this war. But it is not clear whose fault it is. Hamas blaming Israel. Israel, in just the last hour, blaming their enemies, saying this was essentially a misfired rocket aimed at Israel. And one doctor at another hospital sending our team a video diary describing the horror, the nightmare he's facing. Listen. It's like earthquake. Everybody, everybody under attack. Interestingly, most of patients are children, women. Even my, you know, my, my child, my child, three years old, she got injured. Infrastructure, everything destroyed. No medical supplies. It is, it is dis disaster. A disaster, he says, with the number of people killed in this crisis growing. At least 3,000 people are dead in Gaza, 1,400 in Israel. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist, who is near the White House with President Biden expected to head to Israel in the next 24 hours, what would be a significant show of solidarity there. But I want to start with Raf Sanchez, who is joining us now from Israel. Raf, start, please, with this hospital attack. Um, since the war began, Israel has been saying it is only targeting Hamas, with a spokesperson for the IDF, the Defense Forces, telling CNN uh, not too long ago that Israel was not behind this. I want to play a piece of that. We did not strike that hospital. The intelligence that we have suggests that it was a failed rocket launch by the Islamic Jihad. What else do we know and what else are we learning tonight, Raf? So, Ali, this is an absolutely classic fog of war situation. I want to be really clear with our viewers what we know, what we don't know. Our teams are not able to get to that hospital. The Israeli Gaza border is sealed. The Egyptian Gaza border is sealed. We cannot get there to verify for ourselves. But as you said, the Palestinian Health Ministry says that the Al-Ahli Hospital in Gaza City took a direct hit from an Israeli airstrike. They say hundreds of people are dead. This explosion appears to have happened in a courtyard in front of the hospital where families were gathering in the belief, the fatal belief, as it turns out, that they would be safe if they were on hospital grounds. The Palestinian Health Authority, Health Ministry, is saying that this was deliberate slaughter. Now, we should be really clear here. Neither Islamic Jihad, the smaller Palestinian terrorist group inside of Gaza, nor Hamas ever, ever admits when their rockets misfire, but we know those rockets do misfire. Now, the Israeli military, in a statement, is saying that at the time this hospital was hit, there were rockets being fired from Gaza into Israel. They're saying intelligence from multiple sources that we have in our hands indicates that Islamic Jihad is responsible for the failed rocket launch which hit the hospital in Gaza. Hallie, again, the Israeli military is not making any evidence public to support its claim. It's citing intelligence that it has not yet at least made public. Two, this kind of death toll Hundreds of people killed is not a death toll that you usually associate with Palestinian rockets. These rockets are deadly. They are dangerous. They do not, Halley, typically kill hundreds of people in a way that an Israeli bunker buster bomb, which is what Israel is using to target these Hamas terrorist tunnels underneath Gaza cities, 
does have the potential to kill hundreds of people. And finally, we should say that the Israeli military has a track record where they say things in the immediate aftermath of a contested event that turn out not to be true in the long run. And the example I'll give you is that when Shireen Abu Akleh, that Palestinian mm -hmm. journalist with Al Jazeera, was killed in the occupied West Bank, the Israeli military said it was a Palestinian gunman who killed her. And months and months and months later, they admitted finally that it was most likely an Israeli soldier who fired a fatal shot. So again, this is a fog of war situation. We have two very, very different narratives about what is going on here, and we have reason to question both sides' version of events. Alex. It is it is putting uh, an intensifying spotlight, Raf, on the situation that is unfolding in Gaza that we have been talking about now for over a week here of um, the, the crisis there as people are trying to figure out where to go. We know that many are running out of food, uh, fuel, for example. Give us a sense of what it's like on the ground and what is happening with that all too critical border crossing with Egypt, the Rafa crossing. So the Rafah crossing remains closed. Uh, it remains the case that Palestinians cannot get out. They cannot out, get out of harm's way. There is no significant flow of humanitarian aid coming in. Um, and those five, 600 American citizens inside Gaza still unable to get out despite days of diplomacy from the Biden administration. I want you to take a listen to a little bit of one of those Palestinian Americans inside Gaza had to say about the humanitarian situation there. We just ran out of bread right now, and we're, we're trying to get it. The thing is that lines, the queues uh, outside of bakeries is simply unbelievable. That's our daily routine, trying to secure drinking water and uh, water for the bathrooms and washing and dishwashing and whatnot. So it is a truly dire situation for the two million people, civilians inside of Gaza right now, people with nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and many of whom seem to have lost their lives in this explosion at that hospital. Hallie. We are going to hit the White House in just a second, Raf, to talk about President Biden's visit there. But I have to ask you, as somebody who is on the ground, somebody who is talking to so many people in the region, um, is there an awareness of that visit? Is there any sense that there could be a breakthrough potentially because of that visit? Hallie, I would say this visit has been turned upside down by what has happened at that hospital a few miles behind me here. Uh, president Biden is supposed to meet Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, in Jordan tomorrow. The Palestinians are saying Abbas has gone back to the occupied West Bank, to Ramallah. It is now no longer clear if he is going to meet with President Biden. The Egyptians have very swiftly, very forcefully blamed the Israelis for this hospital strike. And it is President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi of Egypt who will be in Amman on the other side of the table tomorrow from President Biden. It is not clear what kind of constructive dialogue there can be tomorrow in Jordan between the president and these Middle Eastern leaders if they are absolutely convinced that Israel bombs this hospital, killed these people, yeah. and the United States is not accepting that version of events. Hallie. Raf, that is critical context as you're live for us there in Ashdod, Israel. Raf, thank you so much. I want to bring in Ellison Barber, who is also live for us in the region along the Israel-Gaza border. And Ellison, at the top of the show, we talked about that conversation that our Richard Engel had with a Hamas leader who claims that Hamas is ready to release the civilian hostages that they capture during their terror attack on Israel. If Israel stops bombing, it is there are obviously a lot of, a lot of caveats on that. Talk us through... Um, how this is affecting the status of operations at this moment and where this goes. Yeah, I mean, it's a very big caveat to say everything has to stop. They told Richard Engel that they would be willing to release all of the hostages within an hour if Israeli airstrikes were to stop. The logistics of releasing as many people as we believe they have inside of Gaza right now, many of them we believe are underneath some of the very intricate tunnels that Hamas has in Gaza. All of that is a little hard to comprehend how that could even be possible. But from the Israeli side of things, they've been very clear throughout this, Hallie, saying that they're not talking to Hamas, that they're not negotiating with Hamas, that they have no intention to do that. They have said they've carried out some limited raids into Gaza, trying to gather intelligence on where these hostages are. Uh, speaking in the days, the week plus that we have been here, I mean, we've been here uh, since Sunday of last week, so nine, ten-ish days about. Um, 
there's not much of an appetite amongst Israeli citizens for there to be any sort of negotiation with Hamas, even though people so desperately want to see those hostages return safely. When I've spoken with people, the way they want that to be achieved is by force, is by having special forces or the Israeli military go in and get those people out, not talking or necessarily trading with uh, Hamas. There was one person we spoke to earlier in the week who said they would be open, uh, and this is a civilian, to the idea of releasing Palestinian prisoners in exchange for the release of hostages. But everyone we've spoken to believes very firmly in Israel that there needs to be an aggressive reaction to what happened on October 7th, that it's not just about the hostages, but also about all of the people that were massacred, the brutality that happened on October 7th, the horrific videos that have circulated, posted by Hamas and mm. militant groups online, showing the way they attacked civilians, older people, young people, children, and all of that, Israeli citizens we've spoken to, they believe there has to be bigger accountability for that. So Hamas is saying that they are open to releasing hostages if their conditions are met, which right now they're saying is Israel stops all of their airstrikes. I find it hard to see a world where the Israeli public would support something like that. And in recent days, when questions have come up and been brought to Israel's defense forces, the Israeli government, about any sort of negotiations or talks with Hamas, they've said that those are not happening. Hallie. Allison, as we talk about the situation with the hostages here, our Lester Holt is talking today with the mom of the 21-year-old Israeli hostage who appeared in this video that was released by Hamas. We are only showing a small portion of it here. Um, if genuine, it obviously shows her uh, under serious distress. Um, so let me play a little bit of that Lester Holt interview. Before yesterday, you didn't know if she was alive or dead. Yeah, I didn't know nothing. I mean, I didn't, I only knew that she was missing until last Saturday. I sat and I watched the video and I wanted to die because I saw my baby so scared and so and wounded and, well, I mean, this is the worst nightmare for every mother in the world. What is next in the next 48 hours here, Allison? Just a lot of uncertainty right now still. I mean, we have seen for days now the massive amount of military equipment, troops on the border. Everything is set to launch a ground assault into Gaza when that decision is made, but that decision hasn't been made just yet. I was so struck listening to Maya's mother speaking to Lester Holton as well when she did a press conference because the video that Hamas released of her, it was fairly short and she very much stuck to a script saying she had been treated, she'd been injured, that she wants to come home. But her mom talked about something a mother could really only see and notice in a video like that, saying that she could tell that her daughter was terrified, her daughter was scared, and that she could tell her daughter was under emotional distress Ugh. and in pain. That's the reality for not just one hostage, Hallie, but hundreds. Remember, Hamas has claimed they have between 200 and 250 hostages inside Gaza right now, and that includes babies, some as young as nine months old. Yeah. Hallie? It is just a nightmare. Ellison Barber, live for us there in the region. Thank you so much. Want to bring you back here to Washington or just outside of Washington now, where you're looking live now at pictures of, of course, Air Force One. That's the plane on the tarmac of Joint Base Andrews because President Biden is set to leave for Israel soon. I want to bring in Aaron Gilchrist, who is with us near the White House now. An incredibly significant moment for the president to go to be getting ready to land in an active war zone, Aaron, and it, with the White House is framed as a significant show of solidarity for Israel. You're absolutely right. It's a huge show of solidarity with Israel for the president to be making this trip. It is uh, complicated. This is a, a, an already fragile situation, obviously, as Allison and Raf have laid out for you. And, and the incident now at this hospital doesn't help uh, to make this diplomatic effort uh, any easier. But the president, as far as we know, is still planning to make this trip. He's planning to go and stand with Israel, as he's, he's been saying for several days now. He will do that literally with the prime minister Netanyahu there in Israel tomorrow to show that solidarity. 
ready to talk about the war effort that Israel is undertaking at this point and how the U.S. is going to continue to support that effort as best it can. As best it can. We also know that the president is going to talk about the hostage situation that is unfolding in Israel. As you've noted, potentially 200 or so hostages there, uh, at least a dozen of them Americans. And so the president has an interest in doing what the United States can to help get those hostage free, hostages freed. There's also this huge humanitarian problem that we've been talking about that is continuing to grow in Gaza. And the president is going to talk to the Israeli prime minister about efforts to get aid into Gaza, to get people, civilians who are in harm's way, out of harm's way as this war continues. And obviously, when the president goes to Jordan, we know that he still intends to meet Ali with the Egyptian leader and with the Jordanian leader uh, and potentially with the Palestinian leader, Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, at least that was a part of the schedule going in. And the effort there, again, is to talk about the humanitarian needs and how uh, resources can be funneled into an area where they can be quickly uh, get to people who need those things. And also about those, those countries talking to other Arab nations in the region about trying to make sure that this conflict doesn't stretch beyond the Israel and Gaza borders. Allie? Aaron Gilchrist, a lot of moving pieces here tonight. Again, you were looking at moments ago, the president's motorcade leaving to head to Andrews for that flight out. We're going to ask you to stand by as we continue to cover this in the next hour or so. Aaron, thank you. We'll take you back to the region because as you heard Aaron talk about, there is obviously, of course, a nexus to Egypt here considering its border with Gaza. The situation there at the Rafah crossing getting more and more desperate. Look at this. Crowds of people who are gathering today. For many of them, this is their only way out. If you can see, and it's tough to see in this particular shot, but we've seen people have their suitcases, they have their stuff, everything they can carry, their whole lives in their hands here, ready to leave the rest behind. Some people have been going to this crossing every single day to see if today might be the day it actually opens up. We feel that we will die in every minute, every every second. We hope we are uh, still alive and we hope that everything is okay. Remember that Rafa crossing, you see it here on the bottom of your screen. That is the only exit point for people in Gaza that doesn't lead into Israeli territory. It's probably also one of the only routes to get help, humanitarian aid, into Gaza after Israel put a what they call blockade on the region. I want to bring in Josh Letterman, who's joining us now. Day after day, we've talked about this crossing here. We've seen all these people head to the border to try to get out. They cannot at this point? Is anything going to change in the days to come? Is it possible, and you've done so much reporting on the president's visit to Israel too, is it possible that that could potentially change the game here? That is certainly the hope, Hallie, that having President Biden uh, both here in Israel and at, uh, in Jordan meeting with leaders uh, from the region, including most notably Egyptian President Sisi, uh, will be what is able to move the ball forward on this. And after day after day, as you pointed out, of people being told eventually this border crosser, crossing would open, that there was a deal in place, that they were going to get this moving, and nothing happening. Uh, last night, we seemed to get a piece of positive news from Secretary of State Antony Blinken after he spent about nine hours meeting with Netanyahu late into the early morning, uh, where he said that they had arranged a deal uh, not only to create some safe spaces within the Gaza Strip for civilians, but also to get humanitarian aid flowing uh, into the Gaza Strip. So there seemed to be uh, some progress. Of course, it's dependent not only on the Israelis, but also the Egyptians. And the Egyptian foreign minister uh, spoke today to our colleagues over at CNBC, uh, saying that he is convinced that it was Israel who has been bombing that Rafa border crossing, making it difficult to get civilians uh, out of there. And so you can see all of the moving pieces here that are preventing those desperate people from Gaza from getting out. Even as the U.S. government has been telling Americans who are in the Gaza Strip, go south, get near the border crossing because we think it will open and you'd better be close by in case it is just a short window uh, in which it is open. But now with this latest incident uh, at this hospital, I think everything is really in flux right now. And even uh, officials who were optimistic that there would be some progress uh, out of this trip uh, over the next 24 hours or so uh, are thinking that the situation uh, is yeah. far murkier uh, and could get worse before it gets better, Hallie. Josh Letterman, thank you so much for that. Two huge stories happening, not just, of course, the war in the Middle East, but also what is happening here back in Washington, because with the backdrop of this international crisis unfolding, there is no House speaker. 
And we're just learning in the last literally five minutes that there's not going to be even a chance to vote for a new House Speaker until tomorrow morning at the earliest, 11 a.m. Eastern time, according to our team covering Capitol Hill. This is after the guy you see here, Congressman Jim Jordan, tried to win the speakership today. He failed. He didn't get enough votes. Too many people voted against him. 200 Republicans voted for him, but as you know, that is not enough. He has to get more votes than that. 20 Republicans went in the other direction, either absent, voting for somebody else, voting for Steve Scalise, or former Speaker Kevin McCarthy as well. The House has been without a Speaker, functionally paralyzed, unable to send any new aid, for example, to Israel for just about two weeks now, also raising a lot of concerns about the potential for a government shutdown. Remember, that new deadline for a possible shutdown is one month from today. NBC's Saho Kapoor is following this for us. There had been some scuttlebutt that perhaps there might be a vote tonight, maybe even in the next hour. Sounds like that's not the case. We're looking to tomorrow morning now. That's exactly right, Hallie. We just got the news uh, coming in in the last few minutes. There will not be a vote in the House for a second ballot for Speaker today. That comes straight from Congressman Jim Jordan, who uh, has been having some meetings, told reporters that he expects the next vote on a second ballot for Speaker to be tomorrow at 11 a.m. This comes as Jordan had, uh, had 20 Republican defections, more than he expected, more than his team had banked on uh, and made clear that his path to the speakership is much steeper than uh, he had hoped by this point. The defections range. There's a broad, uh, you know, cross section of members in the in the conference, including members from swing districts that President Biden carried in 2020. They're not comfortable with Jim Jordan being speaker. A lot of them are from New York. There are a number of appropriators as well in that powerful committee that you know writes some of the most important bills to fund the government. One of the hard no's for Jim Jordan is Congressman Carlos Jimenez, who represents a district in South Florida. I want to play what he had to say. I'm not supporting Jim Jordan. I'm supporting Kevin McCarthy. I think Kevin McCarthy was the, the, the choice of the conference. 96% of us voted to maintain him as speaker. So, you know, for me, I don't know why we're settling. We should go back to what we had. Now, Jimenez is probably the firmest no vote. There are some others who uh, appear movable, who cast votes for, for instance, Steve Scalise, as a way to protest what they perceive as uh, poor treatment of him after he was nominated and ultimately had to withdraw. Uh, it, McCarthy, it should be noted, uh, got 203 votes in the first of his 15 ballots, Hallie, and Jordan got 200 votes today. So Jordan's got a bit of a steeper hill to climb than Kevin McCarthy when he had to face 15 ballots. This is still a mess. The House Republican conference is a mess. This quagmire persists, and there's no clear path out of it at this moment, Hallie. Well, I mean, I hear you when you say no clear path out of it. That is not a satisfactory answer. Like, to a lot of people who are wondering, hey, why can't our Congress kind of get it together here and pick a House speaker? What is a potential end game on this, right? Like, if Jim Jordan doesn't get enough Republicans to move, what's, what's plan B? Yeah, I can offer several possibilities on where this goes from here, Hallie, give me the without most making any likely. predictions on which yeah, one will pan predict. out. Don't predict. Don't predict. Just give me the sense, based on your reporting, what seems like could be the most likely plan B. So the first uh, big question is tomorrow in the second ballot vote, does Jordan improve his numbers or do things get worse? We are hearing conflicting things from Republican members and aides. Some believe that he will improve and chip away at his holdouts, and others believe that his defections will grow. If that happens, he is in deep trouble, and it, his speakership bid is likely to collapse very quickly. And at that point, Republicans have a, a serious question. Do they, as more and more Republicans and even some Democrats are suggesting, empower temporary Temporary Speaker Patrick McHenry for you know a short period, 15 days, 30 days, uh, to keep the government funded to make sure basic business gets conducted. And the second option is uh, they move on to another name. There are some Republicans who have even suggested bring back Kevin McCarthy. He had 96 percent support, more support uh, when he was ousted than jo Jim Jordan has today. These are all long shots. It's hard to imagine McCarthy coming back given the depth of opposition yeah. uh, from those eight members. But it's like I said, Hallie, it's just hard to know where this goes. And I, and I, if there's anybody I'm not going to ask to look into a crystal ball, Sahil, it is you and our Capitol Hill team, because that is, um, uh, would not have a positive outcome. Sahil, thank you so much. I want to bring in somebody who also does not have a crystal ball, but who does have a vote on the House floor. That's Republican Congressman Greg Murphy from North Carolina, who just voted for Jim Jordan in that first vote. Um, Congressman, thank you so much for being on with us tonight. Sure, sure. Happy to be here. Of course. So listen, if you heard any piece of my conversation there with my colleague, Sahil Kapoor, there was some thinking that maybe there would be another vote for Speaker tonight. We now know that is, that is going to happen tomorrow morning. Right. Is Jim Jordan, in your view, based on what you know, going to get to 217 by then? 
Well, I think the next voter, the next round of voting, Holly, will, will show that the, some of the individuals who protested today because of what happened with Speaker McCarthy, what happened with Steve Scalise was not right. And it was there were protest votes. So there's a, one segment. I think those folks will eventually move on and come to support the candidate that uh, the conference has now uh, put up for vote. There are a few others that are hardliners that, you know, some people have uh, some real regrets about uh, what Jim did early in his career. Um, but I think Jim has moved on. My hope is that we get together and have uh, have a speaker. You know, I've said all along, uh, it could very well be a, a compromise candidate, somebody like Kevin Hearn or Mike Johnson, yeah. uh, both of whom have been involved in the RSC. But we'll see. Uh, you know, these are these are difficult times. You talk about, I mean, it sounds like you're leaving the door open to a degree if Jim Jordan can't get over the finish line. There's some bubbling conversations that I've heard as well about the potential to empower Patrick McHenry. He, of course, is the sure. current caretaker speaker to kind of temporarily take over just for a limited period of time. We know he doesn't really want that job full time. Yeah, um, sure. Is that something that you would support if that came, came up? You know, if push came to shove and Patrick would agree to that, I know Patrick has told me point blank he does not want to be speaker. But if in an effort to move forward as a conference, move forward as a country that we need to do, sure, I would I, I would support okay. that if that came to, to, to the point of being. That said, I do think there are other people that are ready to come to the uh, batter okay. circle who could do the job and who could, could get the votes. I mean, I've been her hearing uh, Congressman Hearn's name for, for days. Do you think he would be able to get to 217, or would you be in the same issue just with the other end of the spectrum from where the conference is? No, I, I know Congressman Hearn very well. I think he's a very capable individual. I think he has respect, broad support across the, uh, the conference and could very well do the job. He's a very smart individual and a very um, intuitive, uh, intuitive candidate. So we'll see. You know, Jim has to basically, you know, acknowledge uh, at some point, if that's the case, that he doesn't have the votes and, re and step down, then it would bring another individual forward. Every day this speakership battle drags on is another day that Israel is not getting the help that it says it needs. Do you worry about the message that this current political domestic crisis sends to the rest of the world for the U.S. on the world stage? Well, it's definitely on the world's radar right now. I don't think Israel's not getting support at the very present moment in time. Maybe in a week, two weeks, three weeks, yes, that's much more so. But today, Israel is getting the support that it needs. Sadly enough, this was brought about by terrorists, um, absolute monsters in uh, another segment of the world attacking innocent uh, Israelis. And, uh, you know, I think they're getting what they need today from America. The longer this draws out, the less likely that's, uh, that's going to happen. We know that the White House, as you talk about aid to Israel, is prepping a request that links both the um, help for that country and potentially aid for Ukraine, possibly sure. border money, funding for Taiwan, et cetera. Is a combined package something that you would support once you do have a speaker in place and that would come to the floor? Now, these are three separate issues. The border is a monstrosity created by the Biden administration where, I mean, hell, we don't even know if Hamas has come across the border or Chinese nationals that want to do damage to the country. So that's one issue. Ukraine is another issue. I think once we're able to guarantee um, accountability um, about where the dollars are going, there'll be a lot more support for Ukraine. But we know we have an ally in Israel. We know they were attacked um, by, by absolute monsters who, who decapitated babies. So I think it's three separate issues with differing levels of support. Congressman Greg Murphy, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I know you have a busy day ahead for you tomorrow. We'll be watching it from here. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Coming up here on the show, some new details on that deadly shooting in Brussels. How police tracked down the suspect and where that terror threat stands now. An update to that breaking news we brought you 24 hours ago. Plus, Vladimir Putin's rare trip abroad. What he was doing in Beijing today. As Hamas makes that alleged offer, they claim, to release civilian hostages if Israel stops bombing, families are left to wait for news, hoping to get their loved ones back. One Israeli woman, Hadass Calderon, has five members of her family who she believes have been abducted here. Her two kids, her niece who has special needs, her ex-husband, and her 80-year-old mother. It is, uh, it is a nightmare. The video posted on social media that we're showing you here appears to show her 12-year-old son, Erez, being taken by armed Hamas terrorists who attacked Israel. She says the family was taken from the kibbutz where they lived while trying to hide from Hamas. I want to bring in Hadas Calderon, who is joining us now. Hadas, um, we are so grateful to you for taking the time to speak with us after what you have had to be through, had to live through over the last week. Um, how are you doing, and have you heard any news about your family? 
I don't have any news. Okay. I don't have any news. We don't know nothing. We don't know how they kept, if they're alive, if they're dead. And we think with a hosted, been hosted. We have uh, this uh, movie that we saw, My Little Son. And as you told, I have five members of my family that have been kidnapped. Erez is 12 years old, Saha, she's 16 years old. My grand, my mom, Carmela, she's American citizen, by the way. She's 80. Today, we, we had her birthday. We celebrate her birthday today, 80 years old. She's not a healthy woman. And my ex-husband, Ofer, and my niece, Noya. She's a, she has a special need. She's, she has autism. Five members. Now we 11 days after. We are in a nightmare, nightmare and hell of a time. We worried so much, so much worried about them. And no information. We don't know nothing. And what can I say? Uh, they've been held by cruel hands. And I just pray and pray they take care of them, you know? And ha I'm asking the whole world, I'm asking the whole world, wake up. I'm ask the, the, the European Union, I ask United States, I ask uh, uh, Qatar, I ask Egypt, I ask uh, Turkey. Please release these people, release the children and ordinary people immediately, immediately. So, so Hadass, given that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. There's a bit of a delay in our, in our comms here, Hadass. But, but given what you're saying here, I wonder how seriously are you taking this comment here by this Hamas leader to our Richard Engel on the potential that they could potentially release hostages if Israel stops bombing here? I think we have to to stop uh, to stop this uh, war immediately to release these children and ordinary people and the other hostage and 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 then uh, you know do what you want but not yeah. you can't do a war on a, on, a, on the back of children it's not human it's like worse than ISIS it's worse than uh, Al Qaeda. They've been uh, really massacre our little small kibbutz. I'm from kibbutz near Oz. It's a small, quiet place yeah. just near Gaza, and the, we really been massacre. We had a massacre and a pogrom. They went house by house and they butchered and murdered mm. and burned the house. We don't ha have a house to go back, but I don't care about house. I care about the children still alive. I think the whole world have to scream, to scream, to release them. Let the, the children go home. It's not their fight. They're innocent, innocent children and ordinary people, sick people that need medicine. It's really too much, too much to to understand the situation. And I. We it just is, crying is. and crying and, and and keep hope and we pray and we ask we ask Hamas please let them go and I ask Israeli government just release them do whatever they want do whatever they need you can't keep like this uh, it's two hundred hostages two hundred it's not one it's not two. <laughs> innocent people, citizens, not soldiers. Can you it imagine is an your impossible child? burden yeah. to bear, Hadas? It is. It is an impossible. Um, it is an impossible thing to bear here. And I wonder, before I let you go, no. just quickly here, President Biden, or, you know, the, the U.S. president is on his way now. To, uh, is is set to leave shortly here for Israel. What message, if you could deliver him a message, Hadas? What would you tell him? as we're taking a live look here at the motorcade pulling up to the airport here. First of Washington. all, my mom is American citizen, okay? And my sons, my, my daughter, they are French people. We are French. I want United States to release my children 
they, they Amer and, and my mom, she's American citizen. And I think they must act immediately, immediately to release them. There is nothing to talk about. Yeah? They have to give Hamas whatever they want and to do the best now, yesterday. You know, they are in a huge, huge danger. Every moment they're still there. And we are getting crazy, crazy, crazy. We worry for them. We we don't know. <laughs> they must make solutions. They must find solution. And uh, the, the, there is a small opportunity of the a window open to do something now. Biden must. I, I think Biden doing his best. United States and France doing their best. And I believe they're coming back. Yeah. I believe they're coming back. Yeah. Soon. They must so act. many people. No yeah. talking anymore. Just act. After that, you can make your wars. Not now. It's it makes them in a big, huge danger. Yeah. Um, Hadass so big, many people. Oh. I'm so sorry, sorry? Hadass. I don't I don't I don't mean to keep stepping on you here. There is a bit of a delay in our communications. I was just letting you know how many people around this country and around this world are praying. Uh, and hoping for the safe return of your family and, of course, of the other families who are living, which pray you describe as a hell. I scream, take, take my voice, take my words, and scream to the sky and to the world, please do something. It's not just my own, own, own private thing, it's the whole world thing, because it's different than, than, than what we ever had before in Hadass the world. Calderon, thank we never you. had this kind of thing of citizens, of children yeah. who've been hosted like that, 200. We hear you. We see you. And your message is clearly coming through. I want you to know that. Hadas Calderon, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank we will continue you, to check you, back with you. you. Of course. Of help, course. Thank you. Help, help. Just help. You hear that message from Hadas Calderon here. The mother whose five family members are believed to have been abducted by Hamas. You are seeing also on the left side of your screen or now full screen here, President Biden's motorcade arriving to Joint Base Andrews. He is about to board Air Force One to head to Israel. You see him there. We're going to stay in this for just a moment to see if he walks over to the members of the media traveling with him to make any remarks as he starts this portion of his journey. Uh, as the president is making this significant show of solidarity to one of our closest allies, Israel. As you see the president shaking hands, and he will ascend the staircase, get on Air Force One, turn around with a brief wave, most likely. I want to bring in Josh Letterman, who is watching this for us as well, live from the region. This is uh, a moment of not just solidarity, but of high stakes and urgent diplomacy, Josh. It sure is. This was going to be a complicated uh, and in some ways unpredictable foreign trip for the president into a war zone uh, in any case, Hallie. But now this has been completely upended uh, by the news of the last few hours uh, of that explosion at that hospital in the Gaza Strip uh, that Israel is blaming on Palestinian militants uh, from Islamic Jihad, uh, that Islamic Jihad and Hamas uh, are blaming on Israel, and that a number of the countries in the region including Egypt, Turkey, and Jordan, have all now said in statements they believe was Israel. And just in the last few minutes, the foreign minister of Jordan has been speaking on Al Jazeera, and he says that the summit that the president was expected to attend tomorrow uh, in Jordan with the leaders of Jordan, Egypt, and the Palestinian Authority president has now been canceled. The Jordanian foreign wow. minister is telling Al Jazeera that President Biden will now no longer be traveling to Amman. Now, we have not heard from the White House uh, or from the National Security Council uh, about whether there are any changes to the president's trip. We have asked. Uh, they have not yet commented on this. Uh, but according to the Jordanian government, this summit is off and Biden is no longer planning to travel. Now, How he apparently is still planning to at least make that first stop in Israel, given the fact that he's about to board a plane. But beyond that, we don't know what's going to happen on this trip, Hallie. 
I was just going to ask Josh how the, I mean, this is significant news here, the cancellation of this uh, Amman portion of the visit here. Um, explain why that is such a factor and how this changes the dynamic. And I hear you, there are still a lot of question marks. And I want to be clear, this information is coming into us in real time. I mean, Josh is reporting this out as we're getting this information. And just to let folks know, again, left side of your screen, that is Air Force One. You saw President Biden board there at Joint Base Andrews, just outside of Washington, getting ready, we believe, to head to Israel. Josh. That's right. But the whole region is now on fire as a result of what has just happened, Hal. You think Egypt and Jordan are the two uh, countries that first made peace with Egypt. They're the ones that in some ways have the most functional relationships within the Arab world uh, with Israel. And now both of them are blaming Israel for this strike and issuing really caustic statements about this disputed event that has taken place, where really the only thing we can say for certain is a large number of Palestinians have lost their lives as a result of this. And in capitals around the world, from Beirut to Amman, uh, we are seeing protests erupting tonight in anger about what has happened. We heard from Hezbollah just a little while ago, the militant group in Lebanon, uh, calling for an unprecedented day of action against Israel tomorrow. So even though the facts are very uncertain uh, and there are disputed set of events about who is responsible for this, clearly this has inflamed tensions uh, in a way that we have not seen really since the the start of this saga, that terror attack uh, about a week and a half ago. And it's really unclear where this goes from now. Uh, does Israel somehow provide some evidence uh, that is believable to nations in the region that have already now publicly said Israel struck this hospital that then forces them to walk that back? We don't know. It seems unlikely that Hamas is going to walk back its accusation uh, against Israel. We'll have to see what the U.S. says. There's going to be a lot of questions right now. Does the U.S. have any intelligence that shows uh, that, that Israel's version of events is the right one? Is there satellite imagery? Is there other information that could corroborate anyone's set of events? And even if we get a better sense of the facts here, does that change the opinion both of the governments in this region and of the people in these countries who are now really uh, taking to the streets in anger, Hallie? Josh Letterman, live for us there in the region. Uh, Josh, you are raising a series of excellent points, and I know that you and the team are going to continue to report that out. Thank you for being with us, for that context, and for that reported analysis. I appreciate it. Again, a live look here at President Biden's plane, Air Force One, just outside Washington, preparing to leave to head to Israel. There is a lot of news happening overseas, obviously, not just, of course, what is the biggest headline around the world, which is that crisis in the Middle East. But you're also looking at another factor when we're assessing the broader geopolitical nature of it all. That is the Russian president in China tonight to visit the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, all to try to show the partnership between those two countries. Those leaders expected to highlight their shared vision for this new international order, one that is not dominated by the U.S. and its democratic allies. They are calling for an end to the violence in the Middle East and reviving talks about the potential for a Palestinian state. We've already seen Vladimir Putin this week urging the Israeli prime minister to avert a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Kier Simmons is joining us now. And Kier, as with so many issues around the world, not just here in Washington as it relates to the House speaker battle, not just as it relates to this visit between Putin and Xi, it is seen through the prism of what is happening right now between Israel and Hamas. That's right. I mean, the world has changed, Hallie, and uh, that's an important, to put it, your, your question in reverse, if you like, that's, I think, an important thing to keep in mind at every step of this, that this is a different world and that the events in Israel and Gaza are playing out in that different world. And, and no two countries are more... Let's put it this way, enthusiastic about that, if you like, about the change in the world, I mean, uh, than Russia uh, and uh, China. And to now you have this week uh, President Xi and President Putin uh, both meeting in China for this conference that is about uh, the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative by China, which is this multi-billion dollar project to invest in countries around the world. Some say uh, it is a way of strong-arming countries around the world uh, by China. But, of course, the whole question 
of Gaza and Israel is front uh, and center. Uh, and what you're seeing from Russia and China is a message in lockstep. Uh, just take, for example, Hali, what we heard the Chinese foreign minister uh, reportedly, according to the Chinese media, say uh, to the Secretary of State over, over the weekend about that crisis, saying there is no way out through military means and using violence for violence will only create a vicious cycle. So uh, the two presidents there, the two leaders of uh, perhaps you could say uh, America's greatest foes at this stage, uh, sending out a message to try to suggest that they are, if you like, on the Palestinian side, hoping that developing countries, the global south, uh, may warm to that because there is a battle for hearts and minds around the world. Keir Simmons, thank you so much uh, for walking us through that. I know we'll be checking back in with you as this progresses. I want to get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, officials in Belgium say the man accused of killing two Swedish soccer fans has been shot to death by police. Investigators are still trying to figure out a motive here, but they say this suspect, remember we told you about this breaking news 24 hours ago on the show? They say the suspect claimed to have been inspired by the Islamic State terror group. Officials lowered the threat level in Brussels from the highest to the second highest level. They say nothing suggests that this attack was tied to the war between Israel and Hamas. Number two, an appeals court is letting Alec Murdoch push for a new trial with his lawyers essentially accusing the court clerk of unduly influencing the jury. There will now probably be a hearing where witnesses like that clerk would have to testify. If it goes in favor of Murdoch, his murder convictions and life sentence could be overturned. Remember, he is behind bars right now for the rest of his life after being convicted of murdering his wife and son. Number three, the FBI says violent crimes across the country last year went down to pre-pandemic levels. Murder down by 6%, according to the report. The reports of rape decreasing by more than 5%. However, car thefts went up something like 11%. Number four, retail sales in September rose for the sixth month in a row up 0.7 percent. That's about twice what economists thought it would be. Online shops, restaurants, bars all saw an increase, but electronic stores, they went down a little bit. Number five, Netflix is hosting its first ever live sports event. The uh, Netflix team is launching the so-called Netflix Cup. It's a live golf tournament. It's going to be race car drivers versus golfers. It's going to happen next month in Vegas. We'll see how it goes. Coming up here on the show, crypto, charities, other countries, all places that Hamas raises money. Who's funding all of it in our breakdown tonight? All as the president gets set to depart for his trip to Israel with so much in flux. That's a live picture right there as Air Force One prepares to take off. We'll be right back. President Biden, you see Air Force One there in the air on its way to Israel as we are just hearing now from... The White House, a White House official, confirming that President Biden will not travel to Jordan. This is part of that breaking news we were talking about uh, just a minute ago here in the show. Uh, the idea that there is now diplomatic question marks over the president's trip here after that hospital bombing in Gaza. Of course, Hamas blaming Israel. Israel saying it was a misfired rocket from the Islamic Jihad. We're going to have much more on that story in just a minute. But NBC News covers hundreds of other stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, former President Trump in New York today in court at that $250 million civil fraud trial, civil fraud trial against him and his company. He criticized the state's attorneys, attorney general, saying that... He should be someplace else campaigning. Keep in mind that the former president is not required to attend, but says he'll be back in court on Wednesday. The former president's former attorney, Michael Cohen, had postponed his testimony because of a health problem. From our Southeast Bureau, officials in Georgia are looking for four inmates, including a murder suspect who escaped from jail in the middle of the night. They apparently got out through a damaged window and cut through a fence. Investigators say somebody in a blue Dodge Challenger may have helped them get out. The sheriff's office is offering a $1,000 reward for any information leading to their capture. And out of our Western Bureau, federal officials say a broken rail caused that train derailment in Colorado that collapsed a bridge over a highway. A 60-year-old truck driver, remember, was killed in that collapse. The highway is expected to remain closed for a few more days while crews work to clear debris. Back to our top story now, the Israel-Hamas war. The U.S. over the years has given Israel billions of dollars in aid to help fund things like its Iron Dome defense system. The Iron Dome, of course, so critical after that terror attack by Hamas about 11 days ago. But 
How does Hamas get its money to operate? Here's NBC News' Stephen Romo with tonight's breakdown. Thousands of rockets fired at Israel. That is not cheap. All adding up for Hamas. It's designated a terrorist organization by the U.S. and EU. That means they can freeze Hamas's assets and aid can be blocked. So where does Hamas get its money? It's a patchwork of taxes on Gaza's commerce, money from Iran and other countries, and even crypto. It has really perfected the art of taxing, some might say extorting, the Palestinian population. Hamas took over the government in Gaza back in 2007. Now tax salaries, aid, imports, and other economic activity there. And it probably uh, adds up to somewhere between 300-something to 400, maybe $450 million a year. It has become by far Hamas's biggest source of income. And Israel has accused Hamas of diverting funds meant for humanitarian aid to finance its military operations. U.S. officials also worried. We share Israel's concern that Hamas may seize or destroy aid entering Gaza, or otherwise preventing it from reaching the people who need it. Another major source of funding, Iran. The U.S. Department of State says Iran gives up to $100 million a year to Hamas and other organizations it calls Palestinian terrorist groups. And Iran has been a state sponsor backing Hamas since its inception in the late 1987. Iran says it didn't plan Hamas's latest attack, but cheering on the results. Officials meeting over the weekend and, quote, agreed to continue cooperation. Hamas also relies on shell companies. Last year, the U.S. Treasury Department sanctioned a Hamas official and broad financial network holding assets worth more than $500 million. These companies operating internationally in Sudan, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Algeria and the United Arab Emirates. A Hamas spokesman responded to those charges last year, saying, quote, the U.S. allegations are incorrect, siding with the Israeli occupation and spreading its false allegations. The group also dabbling in cryptocurrency and blockchain technology to fundraise and to move money, which Chainalysis says they track. The militant wing of Hamas solicit donations via cryptocurrency. On their website, Israel's police saying they recently froze cryptocurrency accounts used by Hamas, adding they worked with British police to freeze a Barclays account meant to deposit donation funds. We can see every single donor that sent funds to that campaign. Crypto donations slowing after Hamas announced earlier this year it didn't want to risk its donors getting prosecuted. Time will tell how Hamas will finance its ongoing fight. One thing we know for sure, it's already coming at a high cost. Stephen, we talked earlier about people in Gaza who are in this desperate situation. I'm talking about innocent civilians here. There are challenges that some groups are facing to make sure that help to those people gets into the right hands. Yeah, they certainly are, Hallie. And this is not unusual for the U.N. There are many places where there's a challenge to get aid to the people who actually need it. The United Nations using planes, trucks, even drones to try to get that aid to people. They have 17,000 workers in Gaza and the West Bank to try to help with this. But it is not for perfect. In fact, just last year, an Israeli court sentenced a Gaza aid worker to prison, accused of diverting millions of funds to Hamas. And in this crisis right now, the U.N.'s agency in, at work here, UNRWA, uh, they've clarified a tweet saying that there's been no diverted aid. They had to clarify because there was word that aid had been diverted. Of course, a huge concern for people offering that aid. As we heard earlier uh, from Secretary Blinken, this is something the U.S. is watching. And he cautioned Hamas, saying that if this aid is diverted away from civilians or taken by Hamas, that there will be a way to stop it. Ali. Stephen Romo, thank you so much. That does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. We're coming on the air tonight with President Biden just taking off from Washington, heading for Israel. As we're just learning, he's not going to be following that up with a trip to Jordan after all. That's after the cancellation of a summit after a deadly explosion at a hospital in Gaza. That explosion reportedly killing hundreds of people. So whose rocket was it? That is still not clear as thousands of civilians in Gaza are running out of water, food and fuel. We'll take you live to the region. Plus, back here in Washington, what one senator hopes to find out from a classified briefing tomorrow. 
plus a top Hamas leader telling our team they're willing to release all the hostages they kidnapped, they claim, if Israel stops its strikes. We're going to have the latest from the region, plus an interview with one Israeli mother whose family is among those abducted. Then, Russian President Vladimir Putin in China tonight to meet with one of his allies, one on a shrinking list, with an international arrest warrant on his back during that ongoing war in Ukraine. So what's Putin up to? Plus, here in Washington, House Republicans deciding just moments ago to call it for tonight, at least for now, and instead look ahead to tomorrow for the next battle to try to pick a new House Speaker. So can somebody, can anybody get it done and get Congress back up and working again on the House side? That's coming up later in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and tonight, another critical moment in the Israel-Hamas war. President Biden, in just the last couple of minutes, boarding Air Force One, heading to an active war zone now, heading to Israel, and what is a significant show of solidarity for that country. You see the president with a wave as he was boarding. He, according to reporters traveling with him, did not answer shouted questions about the canceled summit in Jordan as that is some developing news we're learning just moments ago. It's coming as our Richard Engel, live in the region, late tonight, is getting word of a new offer from Hamas, claiming they'd release the hostages they kidnapped in that terror attack 11 days ago if Israel stops bombing Gaza. Still so many questions on that, and so many questions on this, too, what you're seeing here. Reports that at least 200 people are dead after a hospital was bombed late today. This is the aftermath, those numbers, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. If that is the case, it would be the deadliest incident inside Gaza so far in this war. But it's not clear whose fault it is. Hamas blaming Israel. Israel, in just the last couple of hours, blaming their enemies, saying it was essentially a misfired rocket aimed at Israel. And one doctor at another hospital sending our team a chilling video diary describing the nightmare that he's facing now. It's like earthquake. Everybody, everybody under attack. Interestingly, most of patients are children, women. Even my, you know, my, my child, my child, three years old, she got injured. Infrastructure, everything destroyed. No medical supplies. It is, it is this disaster. A disaster, he says, with the number of people killed in this crisis growing. At least 3,000 people are believed to be dead in Gaza, 1,400 in Israel. Josh Letterman is joining us live on the ground in Tel Aviv, but I want to start with Ellison Barber, who was closer to the Israeli border with Gaza. Ellison, start us off here on this hospital bombing, what we know and what we don't know at this hour. Hallie, right before I walked over here to talk to you, we were listening to a virtual briefing with Israel's defense forces. They're commenting in more detail on that bombing, that attack that happened on the hospital inside of Gaza, reiterating their claims that they had nothing to do with this. They went on further to say that the IDF is going to release more footage as well as audio recording. They say their intelligence units have gathered of Islamic Jihad talking about uh, this attack. They say that that recording will show that Islamic Jihad was behind this. He was asked by someone if they think that this was an, int an intentional strike by Islamic Jihad or some sort of misfire accident. He said that they were not sure. But another thing he said that is important to tell you right now is that he says they're collecting all of this and plan to have a full briefing when President Biden arrives on the ground here in Israel as it relates to this hospital. Inside of Gaza, the health ministry there, Hamas, other groups, other aid groups, they are still saying that this attack was done by Israel, that it was the result of Israeli airstrikes. What we know for sure is that hundreds of people are dead and the majority of them are civilians. I just got a, a statement from a doctor who is working in the hospital, another hospital in Gaza City, one of the largest hospitals there that has received a lot of the victims from this other hospital, Al-Ahali, and also the bodies of the victims. And he said this, and I'm quoting, he is, uh, I will tell you also his name is Dr. Abu Safaya. He is Med Global's lead physician in Gaza right now. He says, we are overwhelmed. We are struggling to help the victims of today's bombing in addition to the patients already crowding our facility. He said, we can't deal with the large number of deaths and injuries. Most of the victims today were women and children sleeping in the hospital. Hallie, that hospital wasn't just treating people who were sick and injured, they were, but it was also a place where people who were displaced internally had gone 
to try and seek shelter, to try right. and stay safe. Remember, because Gaza is such a small territory and so densely populated, people don't have a lot of options for places to go for safety. So they often will go to hospitals or stay in UN run schools because they tend to be the most solidified structures. People were at that hospital thinking they were going to be safe. There was an explosion. Hundreds are dead. Israel is denying that they had anything to do with it. Hamas, the Palestinian health ministry, they're saying Israel did this and that hundreds of people are now dead, the majority of them civilians. Hallie. Ellison, that's critical new information here. Thank you for that. There's also this piece of this as it relates to these um, potential, potential hostage negotiations. We talked about this right at the top of the show, that Hamas leader telling our Richard Engel that potentially Hamas may agree to release all of the hostages it abducted after that terror attack if Israel stops bombing. A lot of caveats there. How should we be thinking about this? How, how, are, how are you on the ground viewing this? So one, we haven't heard from Israel directly to this latest news. We haven't heard from the IDF on this latest claim. They often will say when you ask them in any briefing a question about something that has been said or promised or sent out on Telegram or other social media channels by Hamas, the first thing the IDF will usually tell reporters is we think you should take that with extreme caution, any information coming from them. The other thing I can tell you is that in a couple of days ago, in recent days, when there have been these questions of would there be some sort of negotiation, when there was talks about Egypt and Qatar being involved in talks to try and get some of these hostage, hostages out, when there were talks about maybe releasing Palestinian prisoners in order to get some of these hostages out, Israel had said that they were not negotiating with Hamas, they were not talking with them, and they didn't have any plans to do that. I can tell you in the past, and this was years ago, but there was a very big moment in Israeli history, in recent history, in 2006, when an Israeli soldier was abducted just across the Gaza border and taken into Gaza. He was held hostage until 2011. It was a massive moment in this country because the entire population desperately wanted that soldier to be returned safely. And ultimately, they traded over a 1,000 Palestinian prisoners to secure the release of that one hostage who was a soldier. Again, this happened over a decade ago, but there is a precedent for some sort of negotiation to be done or trades to get people out, if we look at that recent example. But right now, there hasn't been any confirmation from the IDF or from Israel that they're open to doing that at this point. But there is a lot of public pressure, a lot of pressure from the families of those who are missing, who are believed to have been abducted, to do something and get them out because it's been 10 days now. Hallie. Ellison, Barbara, live for us there in the region. Ellison, thank you so much. I want to bring in Josh Letterman, who is joining us now uh, a little bit further away from where Ellison is there in Tel Aviv. Um, Josh, we are getting a lot of new information in, and Ellison talked about this right at the top of the show, this hospital bombing now that has in many ways changed so much diplomatically of the president's visit to Israel just minutes and hours before he got on that plane to head to Israel. We know that Air Force One is up now. He is on his way for at least this first leg. He will not go to Jordan as originally planned. Explain why that's so significant. Well, all of this is remarkably significant for how this conflict is going to develop. This next 24 hours, Hallie, I, I think will be one of the biggest tests of President Biden's presidency, of his diplomatic skills, uh, of the ability of uh, Israel's government to respond quickly and convincingly with intelligence, as Ellison just described. They plan to release more information and have a briefing uh, proving, uh, in their words, that this was not them. It's going to be a major test uh, of of the other governments in the region, uh, whether their relationships with Israel, countries like Egypt and Jordan, that have long since made peace with Israel, as well as the other Arab nations uh, in a region where we have been reporting for uh, well over a year now about warming ties between Israel uh, and its Arab neighbors, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco. Are these countries going to give Israel uh, the benefit of the doubt when it comes to Israel insisting it did not bomb this hospital, uh, or are they going to 
continue with the public statements that they have made over the last few hours, uh, very aggressively and uh, angrily blaming Israel for this uh, extraordinarily tragic uh, and deadly strike on this hospital. And which side this all falls on is going to have dramatic implications, not only for this particular crisis, whether they're going to be able to uh, calm tensions, get humanitarian aid in, uh, try to reduce uh, the back and forth in strikes between Hamas and uh, and Israel, but also potentially for Israel's ability to have functioning relationships with these governments uh, going forward. We're going to have to see uh, exactly how President Biden's going to handle that, what he will say uh, about this strike and what the U.S. knows about it when he meets with Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, when yeah. he sees the public or speaks to reporters if he decides to do that uh, while he is here in Israel. But it is clear that everything that we thought we knew about what President Biden was going to be able to do, uh, both here in Israel and on that stop in Jordan that has now been canceled, uh, all of that has now been thrown out the window, Hallie. And Josh, the backdrop to it all in Gaza, of course, as Ellison referenced here, many people had shown up to some of these hospitals, um, in this hospital in particular, it is believed, because they don't have many other options of where to go. That Rafa crossing between uh, Egypt and Gaza remains closed. For so many people, it is a desperate situation. We've seen people showing up with suitcases, what they can carry, what they own in their hands. As you're seeing the map here, and you see it at the bottom of your screen, just so people get a sense of the geography here, northern Gaza at the top, southern Gaza at the bottom and that crossing with Egypt there labeled in yellow as Rafa. Josh, uh, the situation there unchanging and that is also part of the issue. That's right. And this is one of the devastating complexities about the Gaza Strip. Uh, Hallie is the fact that one of the only places that appear to be safe in Gaza uh, is hospitals alongside schools and sometimes U.N. facilities that are there. And so uh, there have been literally tens of thousands of Gazans packed into individual hospitals. Uh, I think the number at Al Shifa, the largest hospital in Gaza Strip, was 35,000 civilians sheltering in the basement. Mm -hmm in the parking lot because they presumed it was one of the only places that would be off limits to an Israeli strike. But Israel, for decades now, has said that Hamas knows that Israel is unlikely to target hospitals, schools, civilian facilities, and therefore uses them as command centers, as launching points for rockets, as storage facilities for their weapons. Uh, and that uh, can make it seem also like it might need to be a potential uh, military target. And so this is one of the most difficult things when you think about civilians who are in a country that is under active airstrikes. Uh, they have been told to evacuate and have nowhere to go. And the very few places that one would that one would think might be safe, clearly based on this explosion and this deadly incident we saw tonight, regardless of who is responsible, clearly are not safe. Allie? Josh Letterman, live for us there in Tel Aviv. Josh, thank you so much for that reporting. I want to bring it back here to Washington now with our chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell, our chief Washington correspondent, as well as our White House correspondent, Aaron Gilchrist, who is outside the White House for us. Andrea, I'll get to you for some analysis in a minute. But, Aaron, let me start with you, because in just the last few minutes now, and, and Josh, and we've talked about this cancellation of the Jordanian portion of the president's trip, trip, but we're hearing from the White House, right? Talk us through that. Yeah, confirmation now that the president will not be going to Jordan, uh, as has been reported by, by Josh and our team uh, in Israel. We've gotten this statement now from a White House official, and I want to read it so you can understand exactly uh, what the White House's logic is behind this cancellation. It says, after consulting with King Abdullah II of Jordan, and in light of the days of mourning announced by President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, President Biden will postpone his travel to Jordan and the planned meeting with these two leaders and President Sisi of Egypt. The president sent his deepest condolences to the innocent lives lost in the hospital explosion in Gaza and wished a speedy recovery to the wounded. He looks forward to consulting in person with these leaders soon, the statement says, and agreed to remain regularly and directly engaged with each of them over the coming days. A statement from a White House official about the president no longer going to Jordan as part of this trip where he just left a few minutes ago to go to Israel to meet with the prime minister there uh, and to get an understanding of the plan that Israel has going forward for this war and also to show his support by standing with the Israeli prime minister tomorrow in Tel Aviv. Hallie? Aaron Gilchrist outside the White House. Uh, Aaron, thank you. Andrea Mitchell, let me go to you now. Andrea, as we've talked about, as Aaron has laid out, this, of course, um, complicates the president's trip here. What are the challenges facing him now and how does, what does a successful trip for him look like on the way home here? 
Well, it is extraordinarily complicating, Hallie, because the Jordan piece of it was carefully planned not only to balance what he was going to do in Israel, but also to look forward, to figure out a way to make the humanitarian aid deliveries, not only open them, which is what they really need from el-Sisi, but open the Rafah crossing, but to make it permanent, because they expect that this war will last once the ground invasion begins for weeks, if not months. And during that period, they don't want the same kind of siege with a lack of water and food, you know, and... Uh, uh, fuel and all kinds of other supplies, the disaster that has been unfolding in Gaza to be unfolding in front of the whole world and inflaming the Arab street, inflaming the region, as well as building European opposition. You've seen protests everywhere. That is what people are seeing. There is a, a willingness to forget what happened just uh, a week and a half ago on October 7th, and at this point, the, the really compelling issue is what's happening in Gaza with this explosion, with this bombing. However, the uh, responsibility is eventually assigned once intelligence becomes clearer. There were denials and accusations on both sides, as you know. Yeah. So meeting with the Arabs was such an important piece of this. It was also, according to uh, officials we spoke to just, this t just today, a key part was what happens the day after. Yeah. Hamas is eliminated. If Hamas is eliminated, which is the goal, a goal that the U.S. has embraced, what happens then to Gaza? Who's going to run Gaza? Israel doesn't want to occupy it. The president said that Israel shouldn't occupy it, reoccupy it. Uh, they withdrew in 2005. Um, they don't want responsibility for Gaza. So the real question is, how do you get the Palestinian Authority engaged? How is that leadership going to evolve? That's why uh, Mahmoud Abbas was such an important part of it. Egypt's an important part, and Jordan, a third of Jordan's population is Palestinian. All of these Arab leaders feel very vulnerable with this blowing up right in their neighborhood. Andrea Mitchell, uh, we are so grateful to have your context and your analysis here for us tonight. Thank you so much for scrambling to a camera for us. We really appreciate it. With so much developing news, not just internationally, the news breaking in just the last 70 minutes, as you've seen here. But we've also seen, of course, against this backdrop, Developing news here in Washington as it relates to that fight to try to figure out who is going to be the next Speaker of the House. We are learning tonight we're not going to have any resolution in at least the next 12 hours. That's because the next speakership vote is delayed until tomorrow morning at the earliest. Tomorrow morning, roughly right around 11 a.m. Eastern time. This is after the guy you just saw, Congressman Jim Jordan, didn't get enough votes to actually be able to win the speakership like he hoped today. About 20 Republicans in all ended up voting against him, essentially. The question is, if there is a second vote tomorrow, as we anticipate there will be, will any of those 20 end up swayed at this point? The House has been without a speaker for just about two weeks at this point, with that international crisis unfolding in the Middle East, as we've been talking about this hour, and, of course, that government shutdown deadline just one month away from today. I want to bring in now NBC's Sahil Kapoor, who was live for us on Capitol Hill. Sahil, um, you know, I had a conversation just uh, in, about an hour ago with one Republican congressman who suggested that if push came to shove and Jim Jordan couldn't get it done, there's this plan B option that he would be willing to consider, which is giving the caretaker temporary speaker, Patrick McHenry, who, by the way, he doesn't want to be the actual speaker, right, but giving him temporary powers for maybe 30, 45 days or so to run things, to actually get the House functioning again if nobody else can do it here. We are now hearing that Democrats are perhaps cracking the door open to that kind of a partnership. Walk us through it. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. That theory is getting more and more discussion as the speakerless House remains paralyzed, as Republicans are unable to unify behind any candidate. They threw out Speaker Kevin McCarthy two weeks ago. Then they nominated Steve Scalise. He withdrew, lacking the votes. And now today we found out that Jim Jordan, uh, the latest nominee on the Republican side, had 20 defections, which is more than he expected. And it's not clear what, if any, path he has to winning the speaker's gavel. So as a backup plan, there's more and more discussion happening among Republicans as well as some Democrats, about the idea of empowering Patrick McHenry, the acting speaker, uh, to be able to conduct actual business in the House. Yes, there's a government funding deadline coming up. There's a, a growing groundswell of support for uh, some action on behalf, of, on behalf of Israel, some aid, some assistance from the U.S. to Israel as they uh, deal with this uh, horrific situation, this horrific attack by Hamas. And uh, the minority leader on the Democratic side, Hakeem Jeffries, 
seemed to open that door uh, pretty wide, uh, uh, you know, just in the last hour or so when he spoke to reporters, talked about how uh, Democrats are having informal conversations that he expects to accelerate about a bipartisan path to open the House. Now, Jeffries was not specific, Hallie, about McHenry in, in particular, but he did say McHenry is among a whole host of Republicans that Democrats respect and believe they can work with. He made, uh, made it very clear that Jim Jordan is not one of those Republicans. So where it goes from here still remains to be seen. It's still a long shot. I got to say the idea that there will be any kind of a bipartisan vote uh, for speaker in times like these, that just doesn't happen, Hallie. But also in desperate times, it looks like they're increasingly searching for desperate solutions. I totally hear you. And that is eloquently phrased, Sahil. I just sort of take the point here that like, it's a long shot. The House has been without a speaker for two weeks, right? Like, we, we don't, these are not normal times here. I don't think that anybody would have had it on their bingo card that it would be 13 and a half days that the House did not have a speaker. From a practical perspective, if this stretches on much longer, um, there are, you know, real functions of government that have got to get done. I get that that government shutdown deadline is still a month away. I get that the White House has not yet presented that aid package for Israel that it is preparing at this point. Um, but at some point, the rubber is going to meet the road. And that point is coming up sooner rather than later. Yeah, it's not a it's not exactly seen as a red alert moment that the yeah. House absolutely has to conduct business today or something horrible is going to happen. There is an enormous amount of frustration. There is an enormous amount of angst among members on both sides of the aisle, uh, you know, about the paralysis in the House, about the need to reopen it. And that's what Hakeem Jeffries was talking about, seemed to be giving, you know, his members a green light to continue those conversations uh, to say that this is a solution, a, a prospect, a bipartisan path uh, that needs to be considered. But look, there are only a few ways this can go. We do expect another vote tomorrow at 11 a.m., a second ballot for Jim Jordan. That's going to be a crucial inflection point for him. Is he going to be able to, you know, cut into his opposition? Is he going to be able to expand his support? If he can do that, then there might be further ballots. He might try to flip more holdouts. If he loses support tomorrow on the second ballot, he might be toast. There may be no path to come back for, for Jim Jordan if the, his opposition grows on that ballot. And there are certainly some who voted for him reluctantly today, Hallie, who uh, might be opponents tomorrow. But again, we don't know where this is going to go. Jordan yeah. feels like, you know, if he still talks to members, his allies still try to uh, win over holdouts that they can do it. We'll find out tomorrow at 11 a.m. Sahil Kapoor, thank you so much. Doing some great work there on the steps of the Capitol, along with your photographer uh, as well. Appreciate it. Coming up, we're going to have a lot more on our top story. Of course, that war between Israel and Hamas, including President Biden's long relationship with that country and its leaders. Plus, a landmark ruling in India tonight, why the highest court in the world's most populous country is refusing to legalize same-sex marriage. President Biden's trip to Israel... The one he's on right now is far from the first time he's visited that country. In fact, his relationship with Israel and its leaders goes back decades to the beginning of his political career. Noah Pransky takes a look at these decades of diplomacy. There are few politicians anywhere in the world with as long of a history with Israel as Joe Biden. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. From floor speeches as a young senator to celebratory messages as president. And I say again, you need not be a Jew to be a Zionist. This week's trip to Israel, his 11th on record, coming almost exactly 50 years after his first in 1973. Just weeks before a coalition of Arab states would launch the surprise attack on Israel known as the Yom Kippur War. Biden would retell stories from that first trip and meeting with then Prime Minister Golda Meir. She said one thing I didn't tell you. We Jews have a secret weapon in our battle. We have no place else to go. But diplomacy wasn't always smooth. Like in 1982, when Israel's Prime Minister met with the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee as tensions mounted with Lebanon. He wound up in a near shouting match with then Senator Biden, who pressed him to end the policy of settlements in the West Bank. The New York Times called it the bitterest exchange of the meeting, while Israel's prime minister described it as a lively discussion. And one of the most pointed clashes played out publicly in 2010 during the Obama administration when then Vice President Biden visited Israel to encourage peace talks with the Palestinian Authority. But after news broke that Israel was moving forward with building 1,600 settlements in the West Bank, Biden kept Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife waiting at a dinner for an hour and a half while releasing a statement condemning the move. 
Biden has not shied away from criticizing the prime minister. Netanyahu has moved in a direction that is counterproductive. But the two leaders still signal they're close, meeting just weeks ago. Joe, uh, we've been uh, friends for, I've checked it, over 40 years. We can make history. Together. Together. And now, after the Hamas attacks, Biden continues his steadfast support for the country he's long pledged to protect. We must be crystal clear. We stand with Israel. Noah is joining us now. And Noah, we have spent, I think, a fair amount of time here in the last hour and a half as this news has been developing about what a big deal this trip is, what a big deal the cancellation of the Jordanian piece of this trip is, um, with a lot of moving pieces here tonight. Yeah, we can't lose sight of the fact that the Middle East is a powder keg. And the president right now is trying to do as much as he can for Israel while maintaining two kind of um, status quos here. One, he's trying to minimize the loss of innocent lives of civilians. The other piece of this is he is trying everything he can do to prevent this battle right now, which is limited at this point to just Gaza, from spreading across the powder keg. He doesn't want to see Lebanon, Egypt, Saudi Arabia get pulled into this mess because if the more countries that get pulled in, the more likely it would be that other world powers, such as Russia, China, United States, get drawn into a bigger battle. That is, is is really, at the end of the day, maybe the most important part of this diplomacy. Noah Pransky, live for us in our Washington newsroom. Noah, thank you. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Gene Shaheen from New Hampshire, also a member of the Foreign Relations Committee. Senator, thanks so much for being on the show tonight. Sure. I know it's a busy week for you. There's this classified briefing coming up tomorrow on this war. What's the biggest thing you're hoping to learn? Well, it, it will be important to learn what we think um, the Israelis are planning to do next. I also would hope that we might get some more intelligence on who actually bombed this hospital today in Gaza, mm. um, because uh, the Israelis are now suggesting that it was Islamic Jihad that did it, and that kind of total disregard for human life is just so horrific. So hopefully we'll get answers to some of these questions tomorrow. We know that President Biden is set to head to Israel later today, later tonight. This is an urgent diplomatic moment here. What should his top priority be? Well, I think his top priority is going to be to support um, Israel in their war against Hamas and to offer whatever help the United States can provide. He's also going to raise concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza and all of the Palestinians who are being affected and what can be done to help with that. And finally, to address the potential for this violent conflict to spread outside of Israel and the West Bank or Israel and Gaza spread to the West Bank and then spread to other countries in the region. Yeah. And I think that's very important that um, he's taken action to um, put our second strike carrier strike group on alert to um, have 2,000 troops who are ready to um, step in, not as boots on the ground, but to provide assistance to Israel in the fight against terror. This is the backdrop that you're describing. Uh, and at this moment, there is no U.S. ambassador to Israel right now. You're going to be part of that hearing tomorrow on Jack Lew. Is it your expectation that he'll be confirmed by the full Senate? And what is a realistic timeline on that? Well, we should have done it before now, but hopefully it will happen as soon as possible. I had a chance to work with Jack Lew when he was in the Obama administration. He's a man of great integrity. He understands the challenges in the Middle East, and I think he will do an excellent job for the United States. But it, it brings to, into focus the broader concern about what happens when we don't have ambassadors on the ground in countries around the world, um, not just to address our foreign policy interests, but to help Americans who are in country. It, it is a huge problem. And right now, we have too many people in the Senate who are holding up ambassadorial nominees who are needed as we're addressing conflicts around the world. And when you say as soon as possible, Senator, do you think realistically by the end of next week for, for that full Senate to vote? I mean, where are you on that? Uh, absolutely. I hope that okay. we can get it done that fast. And again, hopefully some of those um, people who are not 
um, part of ma mainstream, the mainstream Senate who are trying to get our diplomat diplomats on the ground will not hold up Jack Lew and continue to hold up other ambassadorial nominees. Right now, we also have an ambassador for counterterrorism who's been nominated, who's being held up. Um, we have ambassadors to other countries in the Middle East, to Egypt. Um, again, a very important country, particularly right now when we need to right. work with Egypt to get the Rafah crossing open. Um, to not have an ambassador on the ground is just unforgivable. And this affects the national security of the United States. I don't understand how some of my colleagues can claim to be trying to act in the best interest of the United States when they're preventing such critical positions from being filled. Very quickly, Senator, before I let you go, you talk about uh, Egypt. You talk about sort of the classified briefing tomorrow in the backdrop there. We've just learned from Senator Chuck Schumer that Senator Bob Menendez, who, as you know, is facing that federal indictment related to uh, dealings with Egypt, will not be at that classified briefing tomorrow. Senator Menendez tells our team that that is by his choice. He doesn't think it's going to change his view on what should happen next. Do you personally hold any concerns about Senator Menendez, who sits on the Foreign Relations Committee with you, getting access to classified material? Are you comfortable with that? Well, Hallie, I'm on the Ethics Committee, and I am prohibited, according to the Ethics Committee rules, from commenting on anyone who has um, had a complaint filed against them or who may be coming before the Ethics Committee. So I'm not going to comment on that, but I will say that as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, I am very concerned that we ensure that the information that's being provided to us is um, held tightly if it's classified and is accurate. Yeah. Senator Jean Shaheen. Senator Shaheen, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank I know you. it is uh, a lot going on for you in Washington. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, officials in Belgium say the man accused of killing two Swedish soccer fans is dead after being shot by police. Investigators are still trying to figure out a motive for the attack, but say the suspect claimed to be inspired by the Islamic State terror group. Officials lowered the threat level in Brussels. It had been at the highest level. It's now down to its second highest level. They say nothing suggests the attack was tied to the war between Israel and Hamas. Number two, retail sales in September went up for the sixth straight month. Like 0.7%, but that's still about double what economists had predicted. Online stores, along with bars and restaurants, saw a spike, but not electronics stores. Those went down. Number three, Britney Spears says that she had an abortion when she was dating Justin Timberlake, according to an excerpt from her upcoming memoir published by People magazine. Reps for Spears and Timberlake did not immediately respond to NBC News' request for comment. Spears also says in the book she shaved her head back in 2007 to push back against her childhood, where she was constantly getting comments about her body. The book, called The Woman in Me, comes out next week. Number four. A South Carolina pepper expert has apparently broken his own record for the hottest pepper in the world. His new Pepper X is from something like three times spicier than his last record holder. More than pepper and bear spray packs more heat, apparently. Number five, Netflix is hosting its first ever live sports event, the Netflix Cup. It's a golf tournament. Again, it's going to be live. It's going to be race car drivers versus golfers next month in Vegas. I guess the question is going to be how many people will tune in to stream that live? We'll be right back. As Hamas makes a, a claim that it is willing to, they say, release hostages if Israel stops bombing Gaza, families there are left to wait for news, hoping to get their loved ones back. I'm talking about families in Israel, families whose loved ones were kidnapped by those Hamas terrorists in that attack against Israel about 11 days ago. One Israeli woman, Hadass Calderon, has five members of her family believed to have been abducted. Her two kids, her niece, her ex-husband, her 80-year-old mother. This video posted on social media appears to show her 12-year-old son, Erez, being taken by armed Hamas terrorists. She says the family was taken from the kibbutz where they lived while trying to hide. Hadass Calderon is joining us now. Hadass, um, we are so grateful to you for taking the time to speak with us after what you have had to be through, had to live through over the last week. Um, how are you doing, and have you heard any news about your family? I don't have any news. Okay. I don't have any news. We don't know nothing. We don't know how they kept, if they're alive, if they're dead. I, we think they're hosted, been hosted. 
We have uh, this uh, movie that we saw, My Little Son. And as you told, I have five members of my family that have been kidnapped. Erez is 12 years old. Saha, she's 16 years old. My, grand, my mom, Carmela, she's American citizen, by the way. She's 80. Today, we, we had her birthday. We celebrate her birthday today, 80 years old. She's not a healthy woman. And my ex-husband, Ofer, and my niece, Noya. She's, uh, she has a special need. She's, she has autism. Five members. Now we 11 days after, we are in a nightmare, nightmare and hell of a time. We worried so much, so much worried about them. And no information. We don't know nothing. And what can I say? Uh, they've been held by cruel hands. And I just pray and pray they take care of them, you know? And I'm asking the whole world, I'm asking the whole world, wake up. I ask the, the, the European Union, I ask United States, I ask uh, uh, Qatar, I ask Egypt, I ask uh, Turkey. Please release these people, release the children and ordinary people immediately, immediately. So, so Hadass, given that, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. There's a bit of a delay in our, in our comms here, Hadass. But, but given what you're saying here, I wonder how seriously are you taking this comment here by this Hamas leader to our Richard Engel on the potential that they could potentially release hostages if Israel stops bombing here? I think we have to to stop uh, to stop this uh, war immediately to release these children and ordinary people and the other hostage and 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 then uh, you know do what you want but not yeah. you can't do a war on a, on, a, on the back of children it's not human it's like worse than ISIS it's worse than uh, Al Qaeda. They've been uh, really massacre our little small kibbutz. I'm from kibbutz near Oz. It's a small, quiet place just near Gaza, and they, we really been massacre. We had a massacre and a pogrom. They went house by house and they butchered and murdered mm. and burned the house. We don't ha have a house to go back, but I don't care about house. I care about. The children are still alive. I think the whole world have to scream, to scream, to release them. Let the, the children go home. It's not their fight. They're innocent, innocent children and ordinary people, sick people that need medicine. It's really too much, too much to to understand the situation. And I. We it just is, crying is. and crying and, and and keep hope and we pray and we ask we ask Hamas please let them go and I ask Israeli government just release them do whatever they want do whatever they need you can't keep like this uh, it's two hundred hostages two hundred it's not one it's not two. <laughs> innocent people, citizens, not soldiers. Um, Hadass Calderon, so many people around this country and around this world are praying uh, and hoping for the safe return of your family and, of course, of the other families who are living, which pray you describe as a hell. I scream, take, take my voice, take my words, and scream to the sky and to the world, please do something. It's not just my own, own, own private thing. It's the whole world thing, because... It's different than, than, than what we ever had before in Hadass the world. Calderon, thank we never you. had this kind of thing of citizen, of children yeah. who've been hosted like that, 200. We hear you. We see you, and your message is clearly coming through. I want you to know that. Hadass Calderon, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank we will continue you, to check you, back with you. you. Of course. Of help, course. Thank you. Help, help. We'll be right back.
The Russian president in China tonight to visit the Chinese leader there, all to try to show the partnership between those two countries, with the leaders expected to highlight their shared vision for a new international order, Putin and Xi, one that is not dominated by the U.S. and its democratic allies. Both of them are calling for an end to the violence in the Middle East and reviving talks about the potential for a Palestinian state. We have already seen Vladimir Putin this week urging the Israeli prime minister to, in his words, avert a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Kier Simmons is joining us now. Kier, as with so many issues around the world, not just here in Washington as it relates to the House speaker battle, not just as it relates to this visit between Putin and Xi, it is seen through the prism of what is happening right now between Israel and Hamas. That's right. I mean, the world has changed, Hallie, and uh, that's an important, to put it, your, your question in reverse, if you like, that's, I think, an important thing to keep in mind at every step of this, that, that this is a different world and that the events in Israel and Gaza are playing out in that different world. And, and no two countries are more, let's put it this way, enthusiastic about that, if you like, about the change in the world, I mean, uh, than Russia uh, and uh, China. And to now you have this week uh, President Xi and President and Putin uh, both meeting in China for this conference that is about uh, the One Belt, One Road uh, initiative by China, which is this multi-billion dollar project to invest in countries around the world. Some say uh, it is a way of strong arming countries around the world uh, by China. But of course, the whole question of Gaza and Israel is front uh, and center. And what you're seeing from Russia and China is a message in lockstep. Uh, just take, for example, highly what we heard the Chinese foreign minister uh, reportedly, according to the Chinese media, say uh, to the Secretary of State over, over the weekend about that crisis, saying there is no way out through military means and using violence for violence will only create a vicious cycle. So uh, the two presidents there, the two leaders of uh, perhaps you could say uh, America's greatest foes at this stage, uh, sending out a message to try to suggest that they are, if you like, on the Palestinian side, hoping that developing countries are Global South uh, may warm to that because there is a battle for hearts and minds around the world. Kier Simmons, thank you so much uh, for walking us through that. I know we'll be checking back in with you as this progresses. To some other international stories now because we know it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, so our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of France, Versailles, the palace, got evacuated again today because of a security scare. It's one of France's most visited tourist spots. It was also evacuated Saturday after a bomb threat. The country stepped up its terror alert level since last week when a suspected Islamist, Islamic extremist stabbed a teacher to death in a school. France's anti-terror prosecutor today says the suspect declared allegiance to that group before the attack. Out of India, the top court there deciding not to legalize same-sex marriage today. Justices basically said it's up to India's parliament to create that law. The chief justice did say the government should uphold the rights of the LGBTQ plus community and not discriminate against them. And out of the UK, climate activist Greta Thunberg got arrested at a protest in London after allegedly disrupting a big energy conference with oil and gas executives. You can see her there standing with some officers talking with her. She told reporters, we have no other option but to put our bodies outside this conference and to physically disrupt. Still to come, crypto, charities, other countries, all places that Hamas has raised money from. Who's actually funding them in our breakdown tonight? Back to our top story tonight, the Israel-Hamas war with the chaos and violence unfolding after that terror attack against Israel. We're taking a look at who actually funds Hamas, really how Hamas gets the money it would need to operate. Here's NBC News' Stephen Romo with tonight's breakdown. Thousands of rockets fired at Israel. That is not cheap. All adding up for Hamas. It's designated a terrorist organization by the U.S. and EU. That means they can freeze Hamas's assets and aid can be blocked. So where does Hamas get its money? It's a patchwork of taxes on Gaza's commerce, money from Iran and other countries, and even crypto. It has really perfected the art of taxing, some might say extorting, the Palestinian population. 
Hamas took over the government in Gaza back in 2007, now taxing salaries, aid, imports, and other economic activity there. And it probably uh, adds up to somewhere between 300 something to 400, maybe 450 million dollars a year. It has become by far Hamas's biggest source of income. And Israel has accused Hamas of diverting funds meant for humanitarian aid to finance its military operations. U.S. officials also worried. We share Israel's concern that Hamas may seize or destroy aid entering Gaza or otherwise preventing it from reaching the people who need it. Another major source of funding? Iran. The U.S. Department of State says Iran gives up to $100 million a year to Hamas and other organizations it calls Palestinian terrorist groups. And Iran has been a state sponsor backing Hamas since its inception in the late 1987. Iran says it didn't plan Hamas's latest attack, but cheering on the results. Officials meeting over the weekend and, quote, agreed to continue cooperation. Hamas also relies on shell companies. Last year, the U.S. Treasury Department sanctioned a Hamas official and broad financial network holding assets worth more than $500 million. These companies operating internationally in Sudan, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Algeria and the United Arab Emirates. A Hamas spokesman responded to those charges last year, saying, quote, the U.S. allegations are incorrect, siding with the Israeli occupation and spreading its false allegations. The group also dabbling in cryptocurrency and blockchain technology to fundraise and to move money, which Chainalysis says they track. The militant wing of Hamas solicit donations via cryptocurrency. On their website, Israel's police saying they recently froze cryptocurrency accounts used by Hamas, adding they worked with British police to freeze a Barclays account meant to deposit donation funds. We can see every single donor that sent funds to that campaign. Crypto donations slowing after Hamas announced earlier this year it didn't want to risk its donors getting prosecuted. Time will tell how Hamas will finance its ongoing fight. One thing we know for sure, it's already coming at a high cost. Stephen, we talked earlier about people in Gaza who are in this desperate situation. I'm talking about innocent civilians here. There are challenges that some groups are facing to make sure that help to those people gets into the right hands. Yeah, they certainly are, Hallie. And this is not unusual for the U.N. There are many places where there's a challenge to get aid to the people who actually need it. The United Nations using planes, trucks, even drones to try to get that aid to people. They have 17,000 workers in Gaza and the West Bank to try to help with this, but it is not for perfect. In fact, just last year, an Israeli court sentenced a Gaza aid worker to prison, accused of diverting millions of funds to Hamas. And in this crisis right now, the U.N.'s agency in, at work here, UNRWA, uh, they have clarified a tweet saying that there's been no diverted aid. They had to clarify because there was word that aid had been diverted. Of course, a huge concern for people offering that aid. As we heard earlier uh, from Secretary Blinken, this is something the U.S. is watching. And he cautioned Hamas, saying that if this aid is diverted away from civilians or taken by Hamas, that there will be a way to stop it. Allie? Stephen Romo, thank you so much. That does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.